Welcome to Conversations from St. Norbert College, a program that encourages good discussion in our community on today's local and global issues. Now, your host for Conversations from St. Norbert College, author, professor, and nationally known sports economist, Dr. Kevin Quinn. Welcome to Conversations from St. Norbert College. I'm Kevin Quinn. Our special guest is Tom Bolin, and we will discuss Pope Francis and his importance to the Catholic Church, and we will also talk about Dr. Bolin's scholarship. Bolin, Associate Professor of Religious Studies at St. Norbert College, is a specialist in the ancient literary and cultural contexts of the Hebrew Bible. He often presents papers at international conferences. Bolin has done several media interviews about the selection of Pope Francis. Tom, welcome to the program. Thanks, Kevin. Well, let's talk about this uh, momentous uh, occasion in the church's history, uh, which is the selection of Pope Francis. But before we get to that, let's talk about the Vatican and how it's organized. Not everyone maybe knows about that. So what is the Vatican and what goes on there? Well, the Vatican uh, is essentially two things. Um, first, it's an independent state, nation state. And so there is a whole, uh, you know, as any nation state would have, there's a whole uh, government bureaucracy that runs things. So the Vatican has its own stamps, it has its own passports, all these, all these kinds of things. And that was something that came about in, uh, in uh, the 20s. There was a, a, a treaty signed between the Vatican and the Italian government. Um, on the other piece that, that I think is something that that's, has really more impact in the world is the Vatican is the, the um, the center, the head, the, the bureaucracy that runs the worldwide Roman Catholic Church, which numbers over a billion members. So how, how that's run. Um, it, strictly speaking, I mean, the, the, the Pope uh, is the, you know, absolute leader uh, in the Vatican. And so it's, it's uh, monarchy isn't really the best word term, but he is an absolute leader. He's elected, but he has really, you know, complete power over decision making and things, but practically, I mean, a lot of that is delegated. Um, the, the main bureaucratic uh, uh, organ of the Vatican is what's called the Roman Curia. Uh, Curia is just the old Latin word for court. And it really, the, the name harks back to the Renaissance and the Middle Ages when the popes really kind of lived like kings and princes and they had a court around them, but there is a governance aspect. And the curia is uh, divided into, we, we, would all, we would call them cabinet positions, I guess, if you give you an analogy, they're called dicasteries. And so there are different cabinet positions in the curia, each is headed by a cardinal. And then each of them, they have staff and, and support staff and, and things along those lines. Um, among some of the dicasteries, probably the two of the more important um, are, one's called the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. And that particular dicastery is charged with sort of uh, taking the theological temperature of the church. Um, it, it, it rarely gets in the news. It usually gets in the news when um, it is uh, uh, making a statement about something that it feels is theologically inappropriate. And so uh, the, the, the CDF for short is, the, is sort of the, the theological watchdog or the referee, if you will. Um, another important dicastery in there in the in the curia is uh, the the con what's called the congregation for bishops, and this dicastery is the one that decides uh, bishops who will be named a bishop anywhere in the world, and so those are two of the most important. The other important component in the Roman curia is something called the secretary of state, and um, unlike you know for us, the secretary of state is someone who represents the United States externally to everybody. In the Vatican, the secretary of state is really sort of it is the it really is the runs the internal mechanism of the church. It's sort of like a um, a, a vice pope, for lack of a better term. Department of Administration. I'm, I'm using some very <laughs> I'm using some very not so great analogies, but I mean it's it's a it's a, it's an important thing to to kind of just m make some sort of contact. And so the Secretary of State really is in charge of the day to day workings of the curia and, and things like that. And so uh, traditionally, the pope would name a secretary of state and, uh, and that particular person would be very, very powerful in, um, in, in the day-to-day work, -day work of the Vatican. One of the things that came out of Pope Benedict's pontificate is that the, the person he named for the secretary, to be secretary of state was someone who turned out to be um, very, very uh, unpopular with a lot of other very powerful cardinals and, and people inside the curia. And so some people take, uh, a, a lot of people have understood Pope Francis's election to the papacy is also that that it's given him a mandate to really kind of, of uh, go and um, clean house in the curia, and his naming of this uh, of having these eight cardinals just this last week that he's, he, he you know he sort of just went off off script and off map and he and he said I'm going to name eight cardinals to sort of be a council around me, 
and these eight cardinals are going to help me in the day-to-day -day governance of the church. Um, it did that, that move did not get a lot of press, which I think is a shame because it's really rather revolutionary. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts of uh, the papal election. Okay. That uh, it's not, uh, you know, there's a small group of people that actually determine this, some of whom come from the Curia, mm -hmm. is that correct? So tell us a little bit about how this, how this goes and what some of the traditions are, how long they've been around, that sort of thing. Well, uh, papal elections, I mean, traditionally the Pope, um, I mean, the Pope is the Bishop of Rome, and historically the Bishop of Rome was elected by the priests of Rome. Um, by the Middle Ages, the, the, there's, the, you have what's called a college of cardinals and uh, who were sort of the, the, the papal advisors, and they still are. And so traditionally, let's say by, I'd say the 1200s, 13th century, right around in there, you have this, this idea of, uh, you know, the conclave where we're going to go and we're going to, we're going to, um, you know, go in a, in a place and we're going to, we're going to, we're going to vote and one of us is going to be elected pope. And so that, that so a lot of the, the practices uh, that we just saw, you know, a little more than a month ago with uh, Pope Francis uh, go back to the, the 13th century. They've been revised. Actually, they were most recently revised by Pope Benedict about a week before he resigned. So, um, but, but that's sort of the, the basics is that the cardinals of the church and the cardinals, uh, the, the latest iteration of the rules is that the, the number of voting cardinals, and a voting cardinal is any cardinal under the age of 80, um, cannot exceed 120. And so at most, I think there were 117 or 115 who went into conclave last month. And so they go into conclave and they vote by secret ballot. And you need a two-thirds majority to, um, to be elected. Um, that, that, seems to be a, is a, a, that seems to be an important uh, component as opposed to simply a straight majority. It, partly it, it sort of gives the, the, the person elected um, a pretty strong mandate. It also sort of prevents um, uh, opposition just from digging in. As you know, as we see, sort of, for example, the United States Senate last night. Uh, so, uh, so those are th th that's sort of the nuts and bolts of it. They're all you know the church is the church uh, the language of the church is gesture and ritual, and so there are all these wonderful rituals bound up around uh, around the election of the Pope, and so it takes place in the Sistine Chapel, um, and it's been in the Sistine Chapel um, fairly consistently. There have been some exceptions for um, at least. Uh, since the 1480s, um, there's the, the they are locked away, um, and that's a precaution. Um, as recently as 1903, you had European monarchs trying to interfere in the conclave. And if you go back and read the history of conclaves, um, for a good 150, 200 years, um, the king of Spain or the king of France would simply say to cardinals in a conclave, "If you like this guy, I'm not going to acknowledge him." And so there was a lot of of uh, secular government interference in conclave. So that notion of being locked away and working in secret is something that's important. Um, if, you, uh, if you watched um, the, the footage of the conclave, it's very dramatic. The cardinals are all in scarlet. They walk into the Sistine Chapel. They swear this oath. I mean, when I think about when I go to vote, I go and vote in my daughter's school and I fill out a little ballot. But when the cardinals, when the cardinals fill out their ballot, they stand in front of Michelangelo's last judgment and Jesus in you know, technicolor glory is gazing down upon them with the with the damned on his left, and the and and the the, sa the saved on his right, and they swear in front. They, the oath literally says, "I swear before Christ, who will judge me, that the person whose name I've written on this ballot is the person I think is the best person for the job." And so there's, you know, there there's a lot of uh, built-in um, of uh, drama and ritual to sort of underscore how serious this is. Of course, what happens is in, when they're actually voting, it's very, it's almost like a religious ceremony and, and it's, it's fairly quiet and they, they process up one at a time. But a lot of the actual um, talking and, you know, and, and, and uh, weighing of candidates and things along those lines happens when they're not in the Sistine Chapel voting, when they, when they have meetings in between the, the leaving of the last pope and, and things like that. And that's where the, the sort of human side of the church comes out and people talk and think about who the best guy's going to be. What, what's remarkable to me is we, if we go back 800 years ago, not a lot of leaders were chosen by election. Right. And, right. and that, that's pretty innovative and, and maybe explains the endurance of the Catholic Church as, a, as an entity. There, there is something to democracy, even there if is. limited. It's, it's the oldest continually elected position, I think, in the Western world. So, so uh, Pope Francis, uh, I think, is being regarded as, uh, as a departure. 
uh, in some ways for the church. Uh, why is that? I mean, why is, why is his election significant? Why is he significant? There are several reasons. Uh, he represents two significant firsts in the church. He's the first... Um, He's the first pope from Latin America, from what we would traditionally call the developing world. Although his parents uh, were born in Italy. Right, his correct? parents were Italian immigrants. Uh, they come from, the, from, from northern Italy. Um, and so that's, that's an incredibly important departure. He's the first uh, uh, pope from the Jesuit order, which is very significant as well. Um, so those are, those are sort of two firsts on, on that score. I think, you know, what's interesting is we talk about Francis' departure, but, but if, if, you, if you read how the, the popes talk about themselves and talk about how they understand themselves, the language of the papacy is always one of continuity. A, a pope will never stand up and say, my predecessors did this, but I'm going to do this. There's always a language of continuity. Um, but that being said, and, and Francis has made those statements too, especially with, with uh, Pope Benedict XVI, but that being said, I, Francis is certainly a departure from uh, Pope, Bened Pope Benedict in, in a couple of uh, sort of um, symbolic kinds of ways. Francis, um, uh, the way he celebrates Mass and the way he engages in these very public liturgical uh, ceremonies, he's, he's really stripped a lot of that down. And so he's just happy to wear his white cassock instead of putting on you know, a st there are all these technical Italian names for all the things the popes wear. Instead of putting on the tr all those kinds of trappings, he's happy to do that. Um, when he came out on the balcony, I mean, actually, if, if you kind of know what popes do when they come out on the balcony, you could see right away when he came out on the balcony because he wasn't wearing all those things. He, um, you know, his, his address to the crowd, I think, was uh, very much, um, you know, out of, out of character as far as what popes would say. He was specifically, what I found really striking about that, and I, I was watching it live and taking notes, is he addressed the crowd as Romans, even though the crowd was obviously very international, and he spoke to them as their bishop, because the pope is the bishop of Rome. And so he, he really came out there not as the pope of the universal church, at least, I mean, he was, but I mean, but he really portrayed himself as, I'm a bishop, and, and this is my new diocese, this is my new city, my new my new place where I'm the shepherd. Um, he asked them to pray for him. That's, I mean, that's a, uh, or to bless him, I should say. And that, that was incredibly dramatic to watch, you know, 100,000, 200,000 people in St. Peter's Square fall silent and bless this, and bless the Pope. And then, of course, the Pope blesses, uh, blesses the city. Um, those were some important um, kinds of um, symbolic kinds of things. And he's borne that out. So he, he, he said he is not moved into the apartments that are reserved for the Pope. He's staying in the, uh, it's a guest house uh, in the Vatican where cardinals stay when they come to visit. He's just staying there. He takes his meals in the dining hall with everybody else. He says morning mass every morning for people who work in the Vatican every morning. I mean, those are some pretty significant kinds of things as far as just the day-to-day. On a, on a, you know, and that actually bears out when, when he was a cardinal in Buenos Aires, he didn't, you know, he lived in an apartment, he took the subway and the bus everywhere, he cooked his own meals. And so, the, I mean, that, those are pretty significant kinds of things. I think for Catholics, Catholics, you know, for us, the Pope, on the one hand, the Pope is an exalted kind of figure, but on the other hand, there's something uh, inspiring and refreshing about a guy who ha holds this position, but also understands it as one of service. And so you see that, you know, in going to a prison and washing the feet of, of males and females, Christians and non-Christians, on Holy Thursday night, which is a major, you know, one of the most holy uh, religious days in the calendar. So he, he's done some pretty significant, significant kinds of things in, in that regard. Um, before we move on, I think I should tell our uh, viewers here that uh, we're doing a little bit of construction and renovation nearby. So if the, the banging you hear in the background is not your television set, uh, but rather uh, the sign of progress at St. Norbert College. <laughs> um, I, I want to talk to you a little bit about what, uh, what Pope Francis would like to accomplish in the next five years. You know, if he, if five years from now, what do you think that he would consider to be uh, a successful uh, papacy? Well, I think part of the reason he was elected, and, and there were certainly a lot of indications of this leading up to the conclave, is that the cardinals, the majority of the cardinals made it clear that the way the church is run on a day-to-day -day basis in the Vatican has got to change. And so he's, he's been given a mandate and, um, to really um, 
you know, go uh, and look at the Roman Curia and look at the Vatican bureaucracy and really, um, you know, uh, I think sort of um, inject new blood if need be, maybe streamline some things, certainly uh, um, coordinate much, much better internal communication. There's often a case, as any big bureaucracy, I mean, even here at the college, uh, I, I wouldn't say we have a big bureaucracy, but in a bureaucracy, the danger is that one component of it doesn't know what any of the other components are doing and vice versa. That's happened a lot in the Vatican in the last um, four or five, six years, and the Vatican has taken, and the church has taken some really major uh, public relations hits because just just for the simple fact that one one part of the bureaucracy doesn't know what the other parts are doing. So uh, that's certainly a, a, a major thing. I, if I can, so that's sort of a, a secular understanding of it. Let me put it in a larger context, though. Francis, Francis, to me, represents the first true Vatican II pope because he's the first pope who was ordained a priest after Vatican II ended. And, uh, and even, you know, Pope Paul VI and, and John Paul I and John Paul II and Benedict XVI, they were all at Vatican II. And so Francis, Francis wasn't. He was a young seminarian during the council. And so Francis, to me, is the first true Vatican II pope. And I think that's really, really significant. As, and so issues change. Think about, if I can use a political analogy, think about with, with President Obama now. We have our first president for whom what he did, if anything, in Vietnam doesn't matter anymore. And think about how that, that piece of political discourse, which was once so important, in American po politics is just off the table now. And so Francis is a, a, a Vatican II, um, our first Vatican II pope. And one of the most important ideas that came out of Vatican II is this notion of what we call collegiality. The idea that, yes, the pope is the supreme leader of the church, but the pope governs the church as with the bishops, okay? And, um, and collegiality at Vatican II was an issue that was debated intensely among the bishops um, because some bishops, and especially a lot of people who worked in the curia in the, in the central bureaucracy, didn't, didn't really want to uh, have a robust kind of sense of collegiality with the bishops. Francis has said on several occasions that collegiality is an important idea to him and that and that and I think the way he call you know he refers to himself as bishop the bishop of Rome all the time he, he rarely refers to himself as pope and the fact that he's named eight cardinals who essentially have I mean I looked at I just reread the press release this morning they're you know they're they're not part of the bureaucracy they're essentially uh, uh, an advisory council to him, and literally the, the language says to help in the in the day to day governance of the church. I think is sort of is him sort of, of spreading out that collegiality, and seven of the eight cardinals that he named don't work in the in the bureaucracy. They're from around the world. Uh, one of whom our own Cardinal Sean O'Malley from from Boston. So how is this likely to manifest itself in the average Catholic's life? What does this mean for Catholics? Is it going to be a radical departure from what we've seen the last few years? Or is it going to be a slow change with maybe different emphases than, than maybe we've seen? I think it'll be slow. And I think, in a lot of respect, I think the day-to-day -day lives of Catholics may not change all that much. I think a couple of things, though, is that Catholics might see a different tone in the church than what they've seen in the past. I think Francis has already done that. Um, his, um, you know, uh, just in this day of instant polling, you know, he's wildly popular among Catholics, and it's because of his his spontaneity. You know, it's amazing. He gives these discourses uh, off the cuff, and they're really quite profound and, and really eloquent. Um, and so, I think Francis Francis's gestures are going to be are going to be very important to people. As far as you know, will he make changes in the church that impact daily Catholics? I, I don't think so as much. Um, I mean, he's not you know uh, he, he's he's not going to change any uh, you know major teachings of the church when it comes to say married clergy or things. I, I think anyone who's expecting that. Um, is is you know or hoping for that is going to be disappointed and that's it. But what Francis is going to do is I think he's going to reorient the church, and in a way that's important. And that is for Francis, you know, the goal of the church uh, for him is is to of course the goal of the church is to preach the gospel. But for Francis, the gospel is specifically and 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 in a very special way directed toward the poor and the marginalized. And that's where he comes from, and that's what he knows. 
Um, when he was a cardinal in Buenos Aires, he'd take the bus into one of the most, uh, you know, uh, one of the largest and most dangerous slums in Buenos Aires, and he'd just take the bus and he'd walk to a church there and confirm 400 people in a day. You know, that's, that's, that's who this guy is. And so I think that uh, Francis may help Catholics, especially those of us who are, who are Catholics in the developed world and are fed and clothed and housed, to maybe think a little bit about those folks on the margins. And I think that would help a lot. And, and I think that even our bishops might, uh, taking their lead uh, from the Pope, might start emphasizing that a little more as well. You're watching Conversations from St. Norbert College. Joining us today is Dr. Tom Bolin, and what you're hearing in the background is uh, some construction uh, noises here, so our apologies for that, but we're not gonna let that uh, get in the way of, uh, of an excellent conversation. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about you and your own background here. That um, It's kind of an interesting story. Um, you didn't grow up in Wisconsin. No. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Texas. In Texas? Just outside of Waco. So how did you uh, make your way from Waco to uh, De Pere? Um, well, uh, in a nutshell, um, I was teaching at St. Mary's University in San Antonio, Texas, um, you know, and I was settled there and everything. But my, my wife is an alum of St. Norbert, and so when a job opened up here, we just had our first child. Uh, she was a little, about a year old, and we thought, well, you know, this might be a nice place to be, and uh, we knew the college pretty well, like the college, uh, and uh, so here we are, 11 years later, so that's kind of how it goes. It's uh, just, it's living proof that you should never say never to things. <laughs> well, you just haven't traveled between De Pere and Waco. You've done actually quite a bit of travel mm -hmm. in your studies. So tell us a little bit about where you've gone and, and what you've studied. Well, I mean, it's interesting. I, I don't really study the modern Vatican. I mean, I'm trained in, uh, in biblical studies. I, have a, I work in the Hebrew Bible, and so I, I, I work with um, sort of the ancient, ancient Israel, ancient you know, Mesopotamia, ancient Greece, things along those lines. So the, uh, and so uh, that involves, I'm, I'm not an archaeologist by training, but I do have to be aware of archaeological um, uh, developments and, and things like that. So I have traveled through... Uh, Jordan and Turkey and, and Israel, um, you know, uh, looking at, you know, uh, visiting excavations and, and things along those lines. I, um, uh, the great thing about biblical studies is it's, uh, biblical studies is an academic discipline originated in Europe and it's very robust and vibrant in Europe and it's very robust and vibrant here and it's really an international community and so we, um, there are a lot of great conferences that happen where you're able to, to meet and give papers and I've been lucky enough I've given papers in, um, in Rome, um, Copenhagen, Edinburgh, Jerusalem. Um, things like that, and so uh, those are always, uh, you know, great, great experiences. Great, uh, e even in this day of, uh, you know, uh, cyber communication, there's something important about spending three or four days with fellow colleagues um, in your discipline and getting having this really, you know, intense, um, deep, lengthy conversations that you can only really only have at, the, at that kind of face-to-face -face contact. Well, you're a professor of religious studies at a traditional liberal arts institution, Catholic liberal arts institution. And we require all of our students to take religious studies, which means that you try to convey to 18-year-olds why this stuff matters. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure it's always been true that 18-year-olds have come from a secular world, et cetera, et cetera. But truly, we live in a different world uh, here now than has ever existed. How, how do you make what you do relevant to them? What, do you, what message are you trying to get across to them? And how do you do that? Well, it's hard. Um, and, and of course, you know, we have a, a diversity of students when it comes to religious kinds of things. We have students who are very religious. We have students who, are, who have had some sort of you know, unhappy experience with religion and are very anti-religious in one way or another. And then I'd say we have sort of the folks in the middle, if I, you know, to, uh, to borrow, you know, uh, not, a, not a Dick Nixon silent majority thing, but, but we have the folks in the middle who I would say are essentially indifferent to religion. Which is very much, I think, the the default American position. And I think, the, you know, if you look at some of the, you know, uh, some of the polling data and survey data, it's like, you know, Americans are, you know, your your average American, you know, oh yeah, religion's an okay thing, and but I don't really think very much about it and things like that. And so, first of all, you've got this varied group of people when you have 30, 35 freshmen sitting in a room. And, and so, um, a couple of things I try and point out, and it's difficult, I'll, I'll tell you that. But one of the things is, is of course, you know. Um, 
requiring religious studies of students at St. Norbert College is, is something that expresses part of who we are, our identity as a college. And so part of what I try and do in my classes is explain really why is this, why is this part of an education? Well, in, in the Catholic intellectual tradition, here's why. And so that's one thing I try and articulate. The second thing I try and articulate to my students is, um, you know, you, you live in a culture that although you have sort of a lot of people who are indifferent about religion, um, I think sort of the, the folks on either ends are, um, are very vocal. <laughs> and uh, this and, is true. <laughs> and if you know, and if you want to move through our culture, uh, no matter what you wind up doing for a living, and be and uh, and move through our culture in a competent way, you need to be articulate in these kinds of things because you don't know, you know, what if your boss, you know, what if your boss uh, is a creationist, right? What if you fall in love with somebody whose parents, you know, are, you know, have a, a bust of Richard Dawkins in their house or whatever? I mean, so I mean, these are the kinds of things. So those are sort of the practical things. But then I dig a little deeper and I say, look, you know, I I, I do fundamentally believe, and I think, you know, and, and a, a lot of of study of archaeology and history bears this out, is that as human beings, there is a part of us that is, um, you know, that that is sort of wired, if you will, or however you want to describe it, um, toward the transcendent. That there, is this all there is? Is there something more? And, um, and apart from me sort of feeding them the answers of that, because I, I don't think that's um, an appropriate thing to do in the classroom, I try and help them get in, get in touch with that in, them, in, their own, in their own experience. You know, How have you raised these questions with yourself? Or perhaps if you haven't, this would be a good opportunity to do so. And then using the Bible and sort of say, here's how, here's how certain answers to this question have been articulated. Um, you know, what do, what do you think their strengths are? What do you think their weaknesses are? What are the differences between them? Um, uh, how do any of these um, inform your own experience of these kinds of things? I, I agree. You know, one of the things that I think is critically important about teaching theology teaching philosophy to 18-year-olds is that this is the perfect time in their lives to introduce what other people have thought of. I, I, what was eye-opening for me when I actually got it when I was 18 and taking these kinds of courses is that, wow, I'm not the first person to have thought about this right. stuff. And while I thought I was pretty clever about how I kind of had it figured out, the fact is there were other people who had thought about it in much greater detail who had maybe the same insights that I was beginning to to comprehend, but they had worked it out. Mm -hmm. And you know, when we think about the traditional 18 to 22 year old that we teach here, I, I personally think this is a really important element of, of what it is that we get that we get done. I can vividly remember the day as an undergraduate almost 30 years ago, the very first time I ever heard somebody say, the unexamined life is not worth living. And um, and obviously, I mean, it's made an impact. And, and I, yeah, I was 18, and I that was ex I was in exactly the right place at exactly the right time to hear that. Yeah, you know, I always kind of looked at education as having a high entertainment element, and I don't mean to trivialize it as such, but that the enjoyment that I would get out of learning something new uh, it was a, an important part of what motivated me to read these things that had small print and, and mm -hmm. big words. <laughs> Uh, we're competing now with video games and Facebook and you know attention span, you know face uh, iPhones and all that sort of thing. Attention spans that are different. What you do is not something that uh, that can be uh, done in in short order. Uh, once again, my apologies for any noise you might have heard in the background due to construction, but that's the price of progress. Even so, I hope you've enjoyed our show. Until next time, I'm Kevin Quinn. Best wishes for good conversations from St. Norbert College.